Shown below is an LRC circuit. The resistance is 600 ohms, the inductance is 1.04 microhenry, and the capacitance is 0.3 times 10 to the minus 12 farads or 0.3 picofarads. The circuit is driven by an AC power source whose peak voltage is 10 volts and whose frequency is 500 megahertz. Because this is the first review video on AC circuit theory, we're going to take a moment for a diversion to understand the concepts behind AC circuit theory before we begin their application. In this class, we have developed three kinds of circuit elements, a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. Each of these circuit elements has a relationship that tells us the voltage that appears across this device when placed in an electrical circuit. For a resistor, the voltage is proportional to the current with the proportionality constant R. For an inductor, it is proportional to the derivative of the current with a proportionality constant L. And for a capacitor, although we originally learned Q over C, we know that Q is the integral of the current with time, then divided by C. If we have an AC circuit, then we know that at the end of the day, the current through this circuit will be oscillating, and so we can imagine it as an amplitude times a sine function, where as always we can't say take the sine of time, but we need the factor omega to correct the units. We can see immediately the time derivative and integral of this function. When we take the derivative, the derivative of sine is cosine, and the chain rule brings out an omega, and when we perform the integral, we will get negative cosine, and we'll get a one over omega. If we put these expressions into our previous three, a very interesting thing happens. Each of these expressions is equal to a current times a quantity in ohms times an oscillator. For the resistor, it's current times R with a sign. For an inductor, it's current times omega L with a cosine. And for a capacitor, it's current times one over omega C with a cosine. This means that we have generated two aspects for a circuit driven by an AC source. The first is that the peak value or magnitude of the voltage is equal to the peak value or magnitude of the current times a factor. We're going to call that factor Z for an impedance. The second thing we find is that not all of these quantities are in phase with one another. We put a phase of sine function into the current this phase is copied for the resistor, but it is 90 degrees in one direction for the inductor and 90 degrees in the other direction for the, a capacitor. Therefore, the quantity that multiplies our current has two aspects to it. One is an amplitude and the other is a phase. At this point, we could bull our way forward and attempt to do a long series of problems immersed in an absolutely freakish nightmare of trigonometry. Or we can find a shortcut, which is a very advanced mathematical thought, but it will make the algebraic manipulations much, much simpler. And that advanced mathematical thought is that the manipulation of amplitude and phase when adding all of these oscillating terms together is exceptionally similar to calculations that we did dating all the way back to the beginning of this course, and that is magnitude and direction. This has a profound consequence, and the profound consequence is this. Rather than bullying forward with the algebra of amplitude and phase as applies to every voltage and every current in the entire circuit and carrying along the integral and derivative of these terms when we deal with capacitors and inductors, we can instead envision a problem involving magnitude and direction such that the solution to the picture problem of magnitude and direction gives us as the resulting magnitude the proper amplitude and as the resulting direction the proper phase. This means that we're going to be solving our mathematics by analogy. What we mean by analogy is that we will recognize that every term in the V equals I Z equation necessarily has an amplitude and a phase and we will treat these as a magnitude and direction. Let's begin by collecting in table form the aspects of the impedance vector 
that applies for a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. The magnitude of the impedance vector will simply be R for a resistor. It will be omega L, as read from the previous formula, for an inductor, and 1 over omega C, as read from the formula for a capacitor. In terms of directions, which in fact analogously turn into phases of these impedances, it's 0 for a resistor, because a resistor has the same phase of its voltage as the current. However, for an inductor, it is advanced by 90 degrees, and for a capacitor, it is retarded by 90 degrees. Finally, we can look at the symbol or arrow that we wish to draw. For a resistor, we will draw this horizontally, representing the phase of zero degrees by a direction of zero, as defined by a mathematician. For an inductor, we will draw it upwards, and for a capacitor, we'll draw it downwards. This table tells us the complete characteristics of the impedance vector, and we need to merely remind ourselves of one more thing, and that is that these amazing quantities, V, I, and Z, will always carry magnitude and phase. To find the magnitude of the V, we simply multiply the magnitudes of I and Z. To find the phase of V, we will add the phase of the current to the phase of the impedance. By analogy, we can understand what to do with the current relationship, which is I is V over Z. In this case, we find that the magnitude of the current is the ratio of the magnitudes of voltage over impedance, and the phase of the current is the difference, difference from divided, of phase voltage minus phase of the impedance. Given all of this information, we are now able to solve an AC circuit problem theory in which we will find the magnitude and phase of a variety of quantities by performing a vector addition followed by some simple mathematical manipulations as given in these two boxes. Let's begin. Because we're given explicit values for R and L and omega, as well as the capacitor, it's useful to determine all three impedances in advance, and this will make subsequent calculations a little bit easier. The impedance of a resistor is simply equal to its value in ohms, so that's still 600. For an inductor, we need to multiply by omega. Omega will be 2 pi times frequency multiplied by the inductance, yielding a value that I'm going to round off to the nearest ohm, of 3267. A similar calculation can be performed for the capacitor, and the result of that calculation, also rounded off to the nearest ohm, is 1061 ohms. If we are to glance through the required calculations, we'll quickly see a pattern. The first two questions deal with the total impedance of the circuit. That's the sum of the impedance of all three of the items. The next three deal with the total current, calculated numerically as a peak value, also as an RMS, and all these quantities need a phase as well. The next three regard the voltage on the resistor, calculating a peak, calculating the RMS, as well as the phase. The next three regard the voltage found across the inductor, listed as a peak, listed as an RMS, and also having a particular phase. The three after that concern the voltage on the capacitor, listed as a peak, listed as an RMS, and determining of the phase. And then finally is a singular question after we have determined every other quantity in every possible form, and we'll get to that when the time is right. We're going to begin our calculation by examining the total impedance. As we said previously, to total impedances, we're going to use vectors. The first circuit element is a resistor. That's represented by a horizontal vector of length r. The second circuit element is an inductor that is represented by an upward pointing arrow whose length is omega L. And finally, we need to add to that, starting at its end and headed downward, an amount 1 over omega C to yield the final impedance, which is the hypotenuse of this triangle. The phase of the impedance will be the direction of the impedance vector. Therefore, we see by inspection that the magnitude of the impedance by the Pythagorean theorem is going to be equal to the horizontal side squared plus the vertical side squared. Because we've calculated in advance r omega l and 1 over omega c, we can do a simple calculation to give us the value of the impedance, which will be in ohms, and it is 2286.
ohms. Finally, for the phase, and as always, since there are so many phases in the problem, we have to say the phase of what? The phase of the total impedance, we recognize that given a right triangle in our diagram, we can take the inverse tangent of the opposite side, whose length is omega L minus 1 over omega C, divided by the adjacent side R. And when we plug in the values, we're going to find 74.8 degrees. This indicates that my figure was not exactly to scale, because apparently omega L minus 1 over omega C is actually significantly larger than R, because the angle phi is greater than 45 degrees. Let's move on to the next calculation. The next calculation has three parts in terms of calculating one quantity. That one quantity is the total current through the circuit. And what we know for any circuit is that the total current is equal to the total voltage divided by the total resistance, but since we're doing AC circuit theory, we're going to talk about the total impedance. This expression can be calculated in two steps. First is the magnitude, and when it's time to plug in numbers, we ask ourselves an interesting question. Since any AC quantity can be represented both by its peak value and by its RMS value, which value do we use in this formula? The answer is either. If current and voltage are both expressed as peak, the formula is fine. On the other hand, if current and voltage are both expressed as RMS, the formula is also fine. Since we're asked first to find the peak current, and we're given the power supply voltage as a peak value, this is what we're going to use as our starting point. The concept of an impedance does not have an idea of peak and RMS, so that's just 2286 ohms no matter what we do. Plugging in the fact that we were told that the power supply has a peak voltage of 10 volts, we can divide by the total impedance and get a current of 0.00437 amperes or 4.37 milliamps. As always, the factor between peak and RMS is square root of 2. We just need to know where to put that square root of 2. And since we recognize that peak is the biggest value you ever achieve, clearly RMS is smaller, and so we're going to need to divide it by the square root of 2, which will yield the result 3.09 milliamps as the RMS current through the circuit. Finally, to determine the phase of I total, we recognize that we got here by division, so we're going to take the phase of the numerator, voltage on the power supply, minus the phase of the denominator, Z total, to get our result. The convention that we are choosing in this class is to call the phase of a power supply zero. Therefore, this answer is simply the negative of the phase of the impedance, or minus 74.8 degrees. And that completes the calculation of all three quantities regarding the total current. As our next step, we're going to simply calculate all three of these same quantities for the voltage on the resistor. For any circuit element, V is IC, so the voltage on the resistor is equal to the current through the resistor times the impedance of the resistor. Because the resistor, inductor, and capacitor are all in series, all three of these have the same current as each other, which is equal to the total current through the circuit. The way we handle this complicated equation is to first consider the magnitudes. So we recognize that the magnitude of the voltage on the resistor will be equal to the magnitude of the peak current times the magnitude of the impedance of a resistor. These magnitudes can either be considered as peak or RMS, and since we were asked to first calculate the peak voltage on the resistor, we'll use the peak value of the current through the circuit and multiply by the Z of the resistor. Plugging in the numbers, the 4.37 milliamps is the peak current total through the entire circuit, and the impedance of the resistor is 600 ohms, leading us to a peak voltage on the resistor of 2.62 volts. RMS is smaller than peak, and so we divide by a square root of 2, giving us an RMS voltage on the resistor of 1.85 volts. Finally, the phase of the voltage on the resistor is going to be equal to the phase of the total current plus the phase of the impedance of a resistor. As we remember from our table, the phase of the impedance on a resistor is zero, giving us a phase of the voltage on the resistor being negative 74.8 degrees. Same as the current. After those three calculations, peak, RMS, 
and phase for the voltage on the resistor, you should start to sense a pattern and you're well served if your intuition tells you that we're going to calculate these exact same three quantities for the inductor as our next step. The voltage on any circuit element including the inductor is the current through that circuit element times the impedance of that circuit element. Because we have a series circuit, the in current through the inductor is the same as the total current through the whole circuit and we will evaluate this expression first by performing a magnitude calculation and then a phase calculation. The magnitude works in either peak or RMS. Let's begin with peak. The peak voltage on the inductor will be the peak current through the circuit times the impedance of the inductor. The peak value of the current is the 4.37 milliamps and the impedance of any inductor is omega L, which we pre-calculated to be 3267 ohms. The result is 14.27 volts as the peak voltage on the inductor. The RMS voltage on the inductor will be smaller than the peak voltage by a factor of square root of 2, yielding an RMS voltage on the inductor of 10.10 .10 volts. Finally, the phase of the voltage on the inductor is going to be the sum of the two terms, phase of the current total plus phase of the impedance of the inductor. This one is finally a more interesting calculation and it's a more interesting calculation because the phase and the impedance of an inductor going back to the table that we formulated previously is positive 90 degrees. Putting that together with the phase of the current, we'll get the result 15.2 degrees positive. And that completes the calculation of the peak RMS and phase for the voltage across the inductor. We have one more triplet to calculate before moving on to the final answer. For our last and final detailed calculation, we'll be determining the peak RMS and phase for a single quantity, which is the voltage on the capacitor. As always, the voltage on any device, including the capacitor, is equal to the current through that device times the impedance of the device. Because all three of our circuit elements are wired in series, the current through each one of them is the same as the total current in the circuit, and we can therefore deduce that the magnitude of the voltage on the capacitor is going to be equal to the magnitude of the total current times the magnitude of the impedance of the capacitor. The prior formula for magnitudes works either in peak or in RMS. We'll stick to peak, wherein 4.37 milliamps is the peak value of the total current through this circuit, and the Z of the capacitor was 1 over omega C, which we pre-calculated early on in the problem to be 1061 ohms. This leads to a peak voltage on the capacitor of 4.64 volts. As always, the RMS of any AC quantity is always smaller than the peak value of that same quantity, and it's smaller by a factor of square root of 2. Plugging in the numbers, we'll find an RMS voltage on the capacitor of 3.28 volts, and finally the phase of the voltage on the capacitor is going to be equal to the sum of the phase of the current total through the circuit with the phase of the impedance of the capacitor. Because the phase of the impedance of a capacitor is negative 90 degrees, the phase of the voltage on the capacitor is going to be minus 164.81 degrees. And this completes our peak RMS and phase calculation for the voltage on the capacitor. Summarizing what we did so far, we added the three impedances as a vector to get a total impedance. We used the total impedance to get a total current, and using the total and current we found the voltage on each element. However, every calculation involved a peak and RMS and a phase. Finally, we have one last calculation, not regarding the circuit as it is, but regarding the circuit as it might be. Clearly, this circuit is not tuned at 500 megahertz signal. Determine the frequency that your circuit is tuned for. If we go back to the original formula for the magnitude of the total impedance, we'll see that the inductor and capacitor enter the second term with opposite signs. A resonant circuit is said to be in tune if this term cancels 
so that the total impedance of the circuit becomes merely the R of the circuit itself. Cancellation occurs when omega L is equal to 1 over omega C or solving for omega when omega is 1 over the square root of LC. This is known as the resonance condition. Since omega is 2 pi frequency, we can solve for the frequency as 1 over 2 pi square root LC and plugging in the numbers for our L and our C, we're going to get a result of 285 megahertz, meaning that the circuit as given was a little more inductive than capacitive because our frequency was a little higher than the resonant frequency of the circuit itself, which is 285 megahertz. And that concludes the long but highly repetitive calculation in AC circuit theory of the RLC circuit.